the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. Stay blessed. For every one of us here, I want you to know that there are destinies connected to you. Is that true? And those, the health of those destinies depend on your personal spiritual growth. As a man of God, your church will always be a reflection of your spiritual growth and maturity. So if you refuse to grow as a man of God, you will live hungry and thirsty and desperate people. Having to make do with the crumbs that come from you being a babe. Yesterday, we examined the fact that it is a tragedy for any nation, any organization, any system whose king is a child. We need to grow so that we can become teachers. So that we can become models. So that we can become references. Skillful in the word of righteousness. This is very important. The pathway to maturity and stature. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, very quickly, I want to show you four biblical indices that can show whether an individual is growing or not. Immediately, this is like a spiritual litmus test. All of us will be subject to it right now and you can tell with precision whether you are growing or not. I have to touch on this quickly before we move to the next aspect um, of what we have to deal with this morning. The Lord taught me this and I have taught the body of Christ this extensively as much as he's granted me grace. There are four biblical indices that measure a believer's growth. How do I know I am growing? How do I know I am making progress? Number one, are you ready? The first biblical index that measures your growth spiritually is your degree of conformity to the image and the character of the Christ in experience. Write it down, please. Your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Jesus in experience. This is the first biblical index to measure growth. No matter how long you have been in church, no matter what kind of spiritual activity you have been involved with, if we look at your life and we do not find an experiential manifestation of the image and the character of the Christ, you are not growing. It's as simple and as honest as that. Colossians chapter 3, when you read from verse 1 to 15, for sake of time, we may not have all the time to exhaust it, but the Bible says, if ye be risen with Christ, if it is true, if it's a fact that you have been risen with Christ, then it says your passions, your appetite, you should seek the things that are above. Is that true? Where Christ seated at the right hand of God. Prove to me that you are risen with Christ. Not just by your confession, but by your passion. I should see where your passion is. The next verse, when we read to verse 15, let's touch one or two of the verses if we can. Verse 2. The whole text is to verse 15, Colossians chapter 3. It says, set your affection on things above and not on things in the earth. He's not saying to ignore the things in the earth, but he's saying in order of priority, I should be able to see a level of passion for the things of God. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Then the next verse, he now begins to tell you to put off certain things. Is that true? Put off. 
and then put on. That you, you remove it like an old garment. Now, you don't hear a lot of this being discussed in church. It's the reason why we raise the kinds of people we are raising. Can I be honest with you? In this kingdom, character is a principal measure of spiritual growth. More than anointing. More than miracles. Character. Character. I can know that the Lord is working in you. Because what I saw in you yesterday as a limitation should not be found again tomorrow. If I, I agree that you come to him as you are, but you don't stay as you are. Please hear me. You come as you are, but you cannot remain as you are. where we allow anybody to come as they are provided they are willing to be made when you come and follow me I will not leave you that way I will make you now I, I South Africa you cook you cook well and you cook a lot and I'm, I know that some of you are chefs you know how it is to make food if you want to prepare food sometimes you have to strip some of the ingredients from their original state they have to bend. That is the price it would take for them to participate in that meal. They come as they are, but if they must be in that pot, you have to cut some of them. You have to shred some of them. You have to blend some of them. If you must find your way from the farm to that pot, you must be willing to pass through that making. Most believers want to be featured in God's program. God's end time program but they want to be featured the way they are with the backlog of pride and jealousy and flesh and lust no sir you come as you are but then you allow the rabbi to now begin to work on you can I tell you the truth when God is pruning you is proof that you are important in his program when a pastor is pruning you is proof that he has discerned that there is great grace on your life How do I know I am growing spiritually? The degree of conformity. Regardless region, regardless tribe, when you come to Christ, I should know you are a Christian, not by your praying in tongues. There should be such a level of dexterity in your character. It is not when you begin to sing Christian songs that I should know you are a Christian. If you have to tell me your name and pray in tongues, you are not a Christian. So the backlog of anger, jealousy, and all these things that came with our backgrounds. Come as you are, but you cannot remain as you are. Second Peter chapter 1. Is God helping us this morning? Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5 to 7. Remember the theme of the conference, the next move of God. We are dealing with all of the factors that are responsible for making this happen. First Peter, please, very quickly. Second Peter, I meant to say Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5. Let's read together. I like it when we read together. Ready? We're reading to verse 7. And beside this, it says, uh -huh, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge next verse and to knowledge temperance or self-control and to temperance patience and to patience godliness verse 7 and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love Don't tell me you have faith. What have you added to it since you got born again? The Bible tells us add. Add. Remember our meal again. You are preparing this. The chef will give you a manual. After five minutes, add this to this. Add this portion to this. Add this portion to this. You do not add equal portions of everything. There are some things you just need a pinch of like salt. But there are some things you need a lot of. We have majored on the minors and minor on the majors. There are some things that must be lavishly at work in your life. Imagine with me that just because salt is needed in your meal, you put a handful of salt. Hmm. 
Imagine that you want to cook rice and rice becomes the smallest ingredient you add. You pick rice and then salt. What did you make? <laughs> salt is needed, but not as much as rice. Can I be honest with you? There are many things we need in our life as believers, but we need to examine the emphasis. This is, this is, this is it. Men of God, remember we are spiritual chefs. According to Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15, every time we meet with God's people, we feed them. The meal is wisdom and knowledge. Are we together? And as we prepare those meals, we have to be careful. There are things we have emphasized in the body of Christ now above Jesus, now above character. You see, that's the reason why the meal that we're producing, the things are not bad in themselves. For instance, prosperity. For instance, greatness. For instance, these things are not wrong, but there is a proportion. We, Jesus must be the center. If I taste that meal, even if it's a pinch of it, I should taste Jesus. More than prosperity, more than healing, more than miracles. By the time the meal is made of miracles, you, are, you have damaged the whole. I will give you shepherds or pastors after my heart as spiritual chefs. And they will feed you with knowledge and they will feed you with understanding you can know a healthy church imagine you know in many parts of africa we we have seen people who have been impoverished malnourished and you can see their state the children don't have to tell you i am sick and you can see very healthy well-fed children they don't have to tell you i am healthy you can look at a christian and know that something is wrong we need to go to that pot and check what you've been eating Are we blessed? Your degree of conformity to the, to the image and the character of the Christ. Galatians chapter 5. Popular scripture. Many of you have forgotten it. You've not read it in a long time. Let's go to the Bible. Galatians 5, 22. Galatians 5, 22. Are we still together? But the fruit of the Spirit. Hmm. Can I tell you this? There is a difference between gifts and fruit. Fruit is proof that the tree is matured. It, a, a, you can give a gift to anything. An animal can, demo, can manifest the gift of the spirit, but not the fruit of the spirit. A fruit means that the tree has grown. There is no tree that has fruits as a baby tree. It has to be a full-grown tree. So when the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, you have to understand this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Can I tell you, these are the conditions that the whole world is looking for. Everywhere across all the whole world, they are looking for the fruit of the Spirit. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. 23, meekness, temperance. He says, against such, there is no law. Against such, there is no law. There are many, many believers who do not have the fruit of the Spirit at work in them. And we continue to justify this anger is a family thing. What then is the excellency of your meeting Jesus? We are jealous, that's how we are. Just leave me. When I'm angry, even my mother knows I've been like that. Then change. This is why you came to church. Are we together now? There are many preachers who can kill when they are angry. They are anointed. But you have to be careful. It was lack of this that made Moses. Even though he met God face to face, he could not get... 
your degree of conformity. When I found this, I made up my mind as a man of God. I said, I will have to train myself by the spirit so that my life becomes an expression of the character of the Christ in reality. Can I be honest with you? Character is not an impartation. You work it out. You work it out. You build character by submitting to the word of God as final authority over your life in all matters. That means regardless how I feel, what does the word of God says to be done in this situation? Your feeling and your pain, you enter a, a non-emotional covenant of compliance. If the word of God says to be instant in season and out of season, then that becomes my template. If the word of God says love, that is it. Your degree of conformity to the image and the character of the Christ. Are we learning something? This is very, very important. Number two, let's hurry up for time. The second biblical index that measures spiritual growth and maturity is your depth of comprehension of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom. I'll take it again. We're in the school of the spirit, so don't worry about my long sentence. I will repeat it until you write it down. Ready? Your depth of comprehension or understanding of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom. Mm. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20. Your depth of comprehension of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom. First Corinthians 14, 20. How do I know that I am growing? How do I know that I am increasing? How do I know that a church is growing? Brethren, be not children in understanding. How be it in malice? Be ye children, but in understanding be men. Can I be honest with you? You can know that you are growing spiritually to the degree to which you begin to understand the ways of the kingdom. The principles of the kingdom should not be new. It shouldn't be strange to you. You shouldn't be in church for one year, two years, and you know nothing about the principles of prayer. You know nothing about seed sowing. Imagine someone who has been in church for three, four years. You have to explain to them the principles. So, no, you should know these things by now. There are principles. Listen to me. This kingdom, the Bible says in Psalm 82 from verse 5 to 7, Psalm 82 from verse 5 to 7, let me quote it fast because of time. It says, they know not, neither will they understand. So this is a problem of ignorance. It says, they walk on in darkness and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. Next verse, verse 6 says, I have said, ye are gods and all of you, how many? are children of the most high. The tragedy is in the next verse. It says, but you shall die like mere men and fall like one of the princes. Knowledge and understanding is what gives you stature and stability. It's important that you are not just a Christian because of your participating in spiritual activities. You must be sure you are growing. What have you learned this year that you did not know last year? What have you learned this month that you did not know last month? Have you added to your knowledge bank spiritually? Applicable spiritual knowledge, not just random knowledge that is useless as far as your destiny is concerned. Knowledge. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Paul was praying over the church in Colossae. And he prayed that they be built across three dimensions of knowledge. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. He says, praying to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they be filled with, number one, the knowledge of his will. 
Number two, they be filled with all wisdom. And number three, they be filled with all, with spiritual understanding. Are we together? Please let me have two gentlemen, very quickly, just two of you. Thank you, sir. Please stand here, please stand here. You would notice that I like to teach giving illustrations because people seem to understand it more. Now, watch this. This man is a child of God. This man is a child of God. I always will give this example. Now, say they got born again the same day. Are we together? And this one happens to be under a pastor who understands doctrine and is now being mentored methodically and raised in a way that you can see the man growing. And this one, sadly, let's assume that he just found himself somewhere around a spiritual atmosphere whose growth is scattered and not methodical. Now, after two years, they come together and you ask him, what do you know about prayer? He prays and you tell him, lead us in a prayer session. And you see him praying and miss because he does not, he's not been taught. Do you know that you are taught to pray? You don't just pray, you are taught to pray. That's the only way to not pray and miss. The disciples said, teach us to pray. They did not have a problem with prayerlessness. It was effective prayer. The issue was not prayerlessness. It was inefficiency in prayer. And Jesus taught them to pray. This man is in a situation right now. He does not understand the dominion systems in the kingdom. He does not know that there is a mystery that can exempt men from evil. He does not know how to defend himself over the wilds of darkness. His, his life, even though he's born again, but you see his experience as though he does not know Jesus. Here comes this gentleman. Now he's been taught spiritual warfare. He's been taught the economic system of the kingdom. He's been taught knowledge. He's been taught character. Who do you think will excel in their Christian work? Are we together? You can be this man or this man. The choice is yours. Your depth of comprehension. In Luke chapter 19 from verse 41 and 42. Luke chapter 19 from verse 41 and 42. The Bible records that Jesus wept twice in the Bible. First was at the grave of Lazarus. Luke chapter 19 from verse 41 and 42. The first time Jesus would weep was at the grave of Lazarus. And they said, oh, how he loved him. The second time Jesus was about to weep was over Jerusalem. He said he came to it and he beheld the city and wept over it. Why did he weep? Verse 2. Please read with me. Ready? One to read. Saying, if thou hast known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. Jesus wept because of the ignorance of the people. You know you are growing to the degree to which you comprehend the truths of the kingdom. Now, I, I, if I call believers at random, now I'm not just speaking to House of Treasures, I'm speaking to Africa, I'm speaking to the globe. Are we together? Imagine with me, like I said yesterday, call a believer at random. Let's have a few believers, for instance, to stand here and let's now begin to interview them along the lines of the principles of the kingdom. And you will see, respectfully speaking, the poor job that we men of God have done. When the average believer is in trouble, they do not understand the weapons of victory. They bring the blood of Jesus, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the word of God, scripture, touching and agreeing, seed. They mix everything and hope that one will walk. And truly one will walk. The challenge is you can never gain mastery because you do not know which walked. Are we together? So the average believer is superstitious in his spiritual approach. I know there is blood in that equation. I know there is name. I know there is scripture. I know there is a seed. I know there is a prophetic covering. I just know that these things are there. Please produce miracles for me. The Bible says, he that strives for mastery is not crowned except he strives lawfully. 
We must rise to a higher level of mastery where you know which spiritual operation is responsible for what outcome. With precision. Watch a consultant as he talks with a patient. Oh, so how are you? And the patient is ranting. I have headache. I have this, in fact, body weakness. And the man is laughing. He's beyond the words, the frail words of the patient. He's looking for specific things because he has been trained to identify patterns that lead to outcomes. And with digital precision, sometimes he may not even need the aid of any machine. He will say, you have malaria. You have typhoid. And he laughs and says, don't worry. In three days, you'll be fine. And the man, he said, you don't even know what is happening. I says, it's true. I may not understand, but you don't worry. Trust my prescription. I was trained. I didn't just become a consultant by luck. <laughs> take this, take that, take this, take fruits. You do this, go and rest. And even when you call him the next day and say, this thing has not changed. Say, just keep doing what I asked you to do. After four days, you are running, playing football, and he looks at you and says, it worked. And every time you have malaria, he will give you the same thing. Are you learning something this morning? Let me tell you this. If you're a man of God here, let this be a word of deliverance. The pressure to make sure you teach something new every Sunday, be delivered from it. In this kingdom, our focus is not newness, but freshness. Because the body of truth allocated for your growth is finite. You can exhaust it and start again. And exhaust it and start again. And exhaust it and start again. This was the strategy that great men like Papa Hagin, they would teach across subjects for the rest of their life. So if you went to their congregations, you would see them solid. Teaching a truth once does not mean members have received it. You must repeat it again with freshness, greater revelation, greater fire. Don't teach giving once. Don't teach righteousness once. Don't teach salvation once. Teach it again and again. That is the curriculum. There is no other thing again. Listen down. Our generation has such an obsession for newness. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. This is the reason why when you check your notes as a man of God, oh dear, I've taught on faith. I've taught on character. I've taught on leadership. What is left? Ah. And then we go online and you just browse. Enter. And you see anything new, without verification, we ship it to our altars and give people something to consume who we'll later find out it is poison. Can I tell you this? Please hear me, men of God and women of God. The way you preach in a conference is not the way you should preach to your people. When you are preaching in a conference, you are constrained by time and you are teaching across two or three days. The highest conference will be maybe just like a week or so and with several speakers. But when you are mentoring your people, be methodical, be intentional, stay there. They are there with you for life. Teach them, groom them, build them. Let your message be in series. Take it step by step. Don't wrap up the whole message of faith in two hours. They will need more than that to be strong. Hmm. Hallelujah. Are we learning? Please hear me. We must be very intentional about training and building our people. So you learn. Oh, you got it. In the university, remember, I don't know how it works in South Africa here, but let, let's say, for instance, you're studying mathematics. There is something called Math 101. Then you do Math 201. Same subject, a higher perspective of it. So there is faith 101, the basics, you just get it. And later on, you meet a stumbling block you cannot understand. You go back, the next faith series will answer that question. Listen, it is when it has to do with knowing God that we can never exhaust him. 
But when it has to do with the weapons of victory given to the saints, the body of knowledge given is finite. The same way a student can graduate from a university doesn't mean learning stops. But as far as the body of knowledge allocated is concerned, you have exhausted it. Are we together? That means you are in this place, you should be able to tell me the role of the blood in a believer's life. At what point in my Christian experience should I apply the blood? At what point should I use the name? At what point should I use the word? What should I do with a spirit that seems to be stubborn? Do I know what to do with it? When I'm constrained financially, why is that so? And what should I do? This is knowledge. If I'm in a situation where defeat is imminent, what is the spiritual strategy to engage at that point? If my life has been delayed by reason of whatever, how can I accelerate my journey using these weapons of victory? Because the Bible shows me that speed is a possibility. So what is the key to activating it in my life? If people do not like me, how can I change that spiritual narrative? By a mystery called favor. How does it work? Are you learning? How can I rise from nothing to a position of influence? Is influence necessary? If yes, what are the keys that control influence? How can I remain on fire and pray in season and out of season? Because in my experience, I found out that prayer is not, prayer is not as cheap as many people make it look. How can I remain consistent studying the word? How can I be so great and anointed yet humble? What are the keys I need to learn? What are the consequences of pride? How do I last and remain? Do you know the keys that govern all these things I have said? If not, then we have a lot of work to do. Are we together? When you send your children to school, they do not teach them just one subject. They have a variety of subjects intended to build them in a certain way. I can tell you, many believers are stunted in their growth. We are aware of many possibilities in the kingdom, but we do not have the keys that activate those possibilities. So if I ask you, does God lift? Yes. Does God bless? Yes. Can I know him more? Yes. Is the prophetic realm real? Yes. Can God restore? Can God favor? Can God turn negative situations around? Can you show me how? You see, Ask a businessman who is a multi-millionaire justifiably. He will defend his wealth by giving you an accurate roadmap. He will tell you, bring someone as naive as whatever. Let him just be opened. In one year, I can transform that person. We must have that level of methodical approach in the body of Christ. Otherwise, I tell you, the spiritual products that will stick will keep coming from the church. Will, we, it, it will be a situation of casualties. Everybody say knowledge. knowledge. Please shout it, knowledge. knowledge. Let me give you an assignment if you care. I'd like you to write honestly. Thank God your note is just for you. Just write every dimension of the kingdom that you are truly yet to handle in terms of experiential knowledge. Let that become your personal project. What do I honestly not know? Do I understand this finance thing? Don't lie and say I know. What do you know about finances? I can give. That's not the only key. This auditorium has several doors. If you have only one key, you may be in trouble. Imagine with me a big house. You may have heard me give this instance. Imagine a very large house with 10 to 12 rooms. If you have only the key to the kitchen and you need to use the restroom, you are in trouble. 
Because the key to the kitchen will not open the restroom. You are in the house, but you are not at peace. If the only key you have is the key to the restroom, you are in the house, but when the restroom will not give you food, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Not a key, the keys of the kingdom. The key that controls your spiritual fire. The key that controls your economic empowerment. The key that controls your excelling in your career. The key that controls your longevity. The key that controls you walking in peace. The key that controls victory over demons and the cohorts of darkness. You hold those keys and you move with them. Every door that stands before you, if it's a demonic door, you search what keys. You open that door and you move. If you stand and it's an economic door, you check. What did my pastor teach me? Believers, please hear me. Our territories are in trouble until we truly have the keys of the kingdom. Not just as men of God, but that the average believer will become so fortified and sound. Am I wasting your time this morning? Please give us Luke chapter 1. Let me show you something very powerful. Luke chapter 1, we are reading the first four verses and I'll plead that you read with me. This is my prayer for house of treasures and this is my prayer for South Africa, Africa and the globe. Are you ready? First four verses. One to read. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Stop there. Just stop there first. There are things that should be most surely believed in every congregation that reflect the grace. If you are oral robots, the healing ministry should be one of the areas that are most surely believed among your congregation. If you are Benny Hinn, you should, your members should not be doubting the reality of the existence of Jesus. They may doubt other things, but not that one. That is the foundational pillar of that ministry. There are things that should be most surely believed. I can doubt others. I'm yet to get it, but this one, no, I've, I've held it. I have my foot in solid there. Verse 2. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Now verse 3. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things. Stop. <laughs> ah, I love the Bible. So a man can have perfect understanding. Look at it now. He is defending his understanding. He's saying, look, it's not pride. I've had perfect understanding on these things. Haven't had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. To write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Why am I writing? Read verse 4 if you are a Christian. One to read. That thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. I want to bring you to a point of persuasion, he says, so that you no longer doubt those things. So that they don't just become your pastor's revelation, they now become your revelation. The woman at the well ran and called the people and said, come see a man who has told me all that I have done. They didn't come because they loved Jesus. They didn't come because they cared about him. They came because of the impact of her testimony. But when they came, the Bible says they sat with Jesus and heard themselves. And later on, they would turn to the woman and say, now we believe. Not only because of what you have said, we have seen this for ourselves. Spiritual growth and maturity is when you get to a point in the spirit where your persuasions are now your own. You have become one with them. Whether you are asked to give or not is a revelation you already have. There's no waiting for any special program. Whether you are asked to pray or not, anything that is told you is a mere encouragement, but intrinsically it has become a revelation to you. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Gentlemen, thank you. May God bless you. Thank you, sir. Are we learning this morning? So, your depth of comprehension 
of the mysteries of the kingdom. In 2 Peter, our last scripture for this very point, 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4. Popular scripture, 2 Peter chapter 1 from verse 2 to 4. It says, grace and peace be multiplied. How? Through knowledge. Grace and peace is multiplied through knowledge, not through desire, through knowledge, through knowledge. Every dimension of grace you seek, there is a knowledge component. If you do not carve the requisite level of knowledge, you cannot walk in that level of grace. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace is multiplied through knowledge. Number three, let's hurry up. We're listing four indices to measure spiritual growth. Number one, we said, is the degree of your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Jesus in experience. Number two, your depth of comprehension of the principles and the mysteries of the kingdom, spiritual illumination, high level spiritual illumination, your encounter with light. Number three, the outworkings of the power and the ability of God in and through your life, the outworkings. The third way we know you are growing spiritually is through the outworkings of the power and the ability of God in and through your life. My goodness. The outworkings of the power and the ability of God in and through your life. Please look up. This kingdom is a kingdom of power. This is a kingdom of results. And there should come a point in your life where as you press towards the things of God, the ability of the Spirit should begin to manifest through you. It has nothing to do with being in the fivefold ministry. It is proof of spiritual health. Now, biology teaches us that when a child grows and becomes a teenager, certain changes begin to happen in your body that prove that you are now transiting. Is that true? From childhood into adulthood. That is the same way spiritually. You see a gentleman who is looking very lean, looking almost as if he's, he's a skeleton walking. But that gentleman gets to teenage and all of a sudden he begins to build and now he becomes a tall, dark, tall, Tall, dark, and handsome. Are we together now? What changed? Growth. There are now manifestations. Ask a baby to lift this. Ask a baby to lift this. They may not be able to lift it. Ask a baby to lift even a bottle. But now you find people who lift crates. They lift all kinds of things. And they just lift it as though they are lifting a piece of rag. That ability came with growth. Can I be honest with you? There are certain mountains that confronted you five years ago and you did not have the anointing to do anything about them. By now, you should even walk as though they don't exist because of the excellency of power that is at work in you. If yesterday's challenge still seemed to have dominion over you, something might be wrong. Are we blessed? The outworkings of the power of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. It says, now unto him who is able to do. Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. According to the power that works where? In us. There is an ability of the Spirit that works in me. This is not just a Pentecostal talk. You have to believe this. As you are growing spiritually, a day comes, you look at your child, he returns with something, a result that you don't like. You know that you have grown spiritually. Son, come. You can lay your hands. And in the name of Jesus, I impart upon you that grace for wisdom. Go and excel. Maturity. You are in the marketplace. You are in a bus and someone is just crying and saying, my life, how will these things continue? And you look at him and say, well, I'm a child of God. So what? He said, I'm about to show you the implication. Can you hold my hand and let me agree with you? We have just five minutes and the bus comes to a standstill. Father, 
Let my life reveal the excellency of your power over this person's situation and you drop from the bus. And after two years, you find someone looking for you and running and saying, I remember you. You held my hand and prayed a two minutes prayer and every closed door opened. I want to follow your God. There is something about the excellency of power. Listen to me. When it has to do with power, it is not for men of God. It is for believers. Jesus said in my name, they, not some, all that believe shall cast out devils. Have you registered your impact in the realm of the spirit through the outworking of power in your life? Can the demon say, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Joshua Selman, I know. Have you registered your name? Can I be honest with you? Most believers think and respectfully speaking, I admit that we men of God have made a mistake because we have given people an impression that if it does not come through us, they cannot access genuine power. No. We are here as an added advantage, but intrinsically, the basis of your confidence and your power in this kingdom is the reality of the, of the Holy Spirit living in you and the power that comes through your relationship with him. He says, be strong in the Lord. Everyone say, I'm strong in the Lord. Prophesy, say, I am not weak. Look at me, stretch your hands before me and declare, say, these hands, you are anointed from today for signs, for wonders, for miracles. One more time, stretch those hands. Say, in the name of Jesus, these hands produce results. In the name of Jesus, these are miracle hands. These are miracle hands. These are miracle hands. These are miracle hands. Turn it into prayer in one minute. I'm not ordinary. The divine life is at work in me. In the name of Jesus, the son of the living God, there is an implication to my spiritual growth. I may not be a man of God standing in the pulpit, but I'm the son of the living God. I decree and declare the power of the Holy Ghost is at work in my life. To heal and to deliver. To change and to transform. My words are not empty words. I carry within me the power of the Holy Ghost. Is someone praying? Believe what you are saying. Believe what you are saying. I have the grace to change situations and circumstances. By the power of the word. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is at work in me. Now listen to me everyone. Please pay attention. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am Do you know what it means to be the child of God? Many of you have wealthy people in South Africa. When you say you are the son of so, so, so and so person, the systems must respond. Hear me. There is an ability of the Holy Ghost that you must tear within your inside. This is not for preachers. South Africa, you are not weak as a believer. You can fail alone, but you and the Holy Ghost cannot fail. You can fail alone, but you and the Holy Ghost cannot fail. Oh, let the weak say, I am strong. One with God, a champion indeed. One with God, a champion in ministry. Parakatos kata, one with God, a champion that his fire flows through you, his life flows through you. You are a winner in the name of Jesus Christ. Man of God, hear me. You are not a weak preacher struggling on stage to have members. No, be strong in the Lord. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is at work in you. Jesus said, tarry ye in Jerusalem. Tarry. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost came 
upon the believers. Oh, please believe this. Our fathers showed us in scripture, God's generals, men like R.W. Shambach, T.L. Osborne, they have joined the cloud of witnesses. They shook kingdoms by the power of the Holy Ghost. You are not weak. There is no distance you cannot get to. There is no height you cannot get to. Please listen to me. Hear me. Believers, every time you sit in church, you are not just hearing a sermon. There is an ability of the Holy Spirit. This is my mentality. Believe me. I do not believe that I can meet anybody and that person goes back the same. No. Sincerely. Sincerely. This is not arrogance. It's true. I do not believe that I can actually shake hands with you and greet you and you go back and your life is unchanged. I will go for a retreat. Men of God, stop acting weak. You are strong in the Lord. Hear me, I didn't ask you to act proud. Pride is what we've been fighting. But there is a confidence. I may fail alone, but not with Jesus. South Africa, believers, when you are going to your office, don't go alone. You will fail when you go alone. When you are writing the business proposal, don't write it alone. Ha! There's a song we sing in Nigeria. When you hold my hands, everything becomes possible. When you hold my hands, impossible becomes possible when you hold my hand everything becomes possible when you hold heba shalanda katapras ketebeleketa shalegaba hold that woman new season new season new season new season by the power of the holy ghost impossible listen listen I want you to walk out of this conference with a mentality that if I am in Christ and I have been grounded in righteousness I am not ordinary the devil will fool you into believing that just because someone is not falling down under the anointing in front of you that you are powerless reject that lie you are full of the power of the Holy Ghost divinity lives in you believe it Believe it. Believe it. Savior, he can move a mountain. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. The author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave Savior He can move a mountain My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever The author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Here's the part I want you to re repeat it again Listen he rose and conquered the great Jesus conquered the great He rose and conquered the great Jesus conquered the great He rose and conquered the great That is the basis for my victory That is the basis for the power of the Holy Ghost All of these manifestations you see it is not from Joshua Selman. When he rose, 
the hymn writer says, up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph all his foe. He arose the victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. I'm not weak. No, I am strong. I am strong in the name of Jesus. I am strong in ministry. I am strong in business. Shake away the weakness that came from your background. Shake away the weakness that came from your background. Shake away the weakness. Oh, South Africa, shake away the weakness. Shake away the weakness. I reject every devil. I reject every weakness. I am strong. I am bold. I am strong. I am bold. I am strong. I am bold. I am strong. Paruska de bakata. Embreketeke bakata. Kashkata bakata. Embreketes katibalakata. There is no height I cannot attain. There is no height I cannot attain. Listen, listen, next time you walk out of this place, God in a man is walking. That's right. Yes. Hear me, the noblest title that you can have is not apostle, is not prophet, is not reverend. Is not CEO. The noblest title you can have is child of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't replace it for apostle. Don't replace it for prophet. They may call you all these names. Take down for me. We're rounding up. This is what I believe. That these hands, when my mother gave birth to me, she gave birth to a tiny hand of a baby. But when I met Jesus, these hands became an extension of heaven. Before I got born again, my voice just made an ordinary sound. But now that I am in Christ, these words minister life. Do you believe this? South Africa, do you believe this? Can I tell you why I know that your nation will never go down? He told Abraham, if I can find one righteous man. So for my sake, I came this morning to challenge you, enough of being a baby, enough of running around, pray for me, pray for me, lock yourself in your room and say that devil, I'm standing with you now, I've been taught the word, Kabaruskata, what mountain? Thou mountain that stands before me, I have the ability of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you this? Please listen. Tonight is a miracle service, but I want to charge you. You cannot bring revival across a territory if you do not believe in what God has made out of you. Businessman, you carry this mentality you will pick up the map of South Africa and look at it as though you are looking at a toy. As far as your eyes can see. Help her, help her, hold her. 
Hold up. Hmm. Take it high. We'll have to pray. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. No wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. This is what I believe about myself. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. No wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Hear me? Those of you who are music ministers in this nation, tell yourself you are taking the sounds of worship from South Africa to the ends of the earth. Don't let nobody talk you down. Don't let nobody speak nonsense. The Holy Ghost. I can fail alone. I agree. But not with the Holy Ghost. That's right. That's right. Yes, sir. It's a winning combination that does not fail. Yes, sir. Man of God, the day you believe this, that is the day you will begin to watch demons casted out of people, destinies change. For as long as you believe you are a weakling, no, it is true that there are systems in the body that make for transference and impartation, but none will replace the place of the Holy Ghost. The greatest basis of your confidence in this kingdom is not just a man of God. It's not just an oil or a man. No. The Holy Spirit. Can I tell you this? When the Lord was teaching me this, I was in one room. And from that one room, He said, if you will believe this, I will take you before kings. You will stand before nations. I was stupid enough to believe Him. Africa, what seest thou? Who told you you were weak? Who told you you are not strong? Believers, who told you you cannot take a territory for Jesus? Businessman, who told you that just because of the pandemic you must remain down? Where did you learn that? When Adam and Eve had another voice, God told them, who told you? Who told you? I didn't come from me. Who told you? You have given your attention to another voice. Oh, that woman who told you that after eight years without a child, you cannot have one. Who told you? Oh, they said that's how it happens in our place. Whose report will you believe? Can I be honest with you? There are things I believe about my life and I believe about myself. One of it is that until my assignment is done on earth, no power under heaven sustains the ability to take me out of this realm before my time. It's not bragging, it's the truth. Number two, I believe that there are over 7.6 billion people on earth. It is impossible for me to be on earth serving the purposes of God and die of hunger. One person has to be obedient enough to be sent by God to see to it that I do not cry. Right. This That's is what right. I believe. I do not believe that I am a nuisance to any territory and anybody. I believe I am a blessing. It's a mentality that I have. When I come to people, I don't look for what to get. I look for what to give. I am a blessing. This, this, this is the kind of mentality that you must have. Don't move around looking at people and the next thing you are, what do I get? What do I get? No. Is someone learning? That when you go back to your shop, you go back to your mall. You go back to your business. Lock the door and lay your hands on the walls. 
and say in the name of Jesus here comes an ambassador I declare let the spiritual gates over my business a fata be opened and you watch what happens by the power of the Holy Spirit your church is not growing don't sit down hating on those who are receiving results that's no right. That's right. lock yourself and walk the length and the breadth of your auditorium where is the grace that brought the animals from the wilderness into the ark of Noah you think Noah had the power to gather those animals wouldn't they tear him but there was a grace that came on him and the ark that is the same grace that can fish those given to you from anywhere to where they need to be. Apostle, the challenge with my business is that there are no customers. I want to give in the house of God, but no one is coming. Now I've told you the secret. People don't just come. There is a grace that calls them. Come on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Apostle, I'm a politician and God has told me that someday, even at a national level, I'll have a lot to do in government. But from my lowly estate, can I rise? Ask Esther. Can I rise? Ask David. Can I rise? Ask Jesus. I tell you why a lot of believers are weak. We ship the pain of our background. I came from a background with no advantage, we say. And then we believe that just because we have come into the faith life, the faith life just caters for our spiritual life and leaves us to be miserable. Reject that. Jesus said, I am come that ye may have life. Apostle, but I don't know how these great miracles will happen. Just as you do not know the way of the wind or how bones are formed in the womb of her that is with child, so also you do not know the ways of God. Leave that one to his intelligence. Are you trying to say by the end of October, my life would have changed? I'm trying to say by the end of today. Come on. Yes. Did the prophet not say by this time, tomorrow? And a foolish man asked a question and said, even if God will open the windows of heaven, even if a man opens his bank account, your life will change. Not to talk of the windows of heaven. I'm shaking unbelief. Shaking unbelief. My time is up. But listen to this. The last index that measures your spiritual growth in addition to your conforming to the image and the character of the Christ in experience, in addition to your comprehending the mysteries and the ways of God, the principles of the kingdom, in addition, listen carefully, to manifesting the reality of the power of the Holy Spirit, the last and the highest biblical index for measuring spiritual growth is love. More than power, more than knowledge, more than miracles, love for God and love for men. If you love God alone, you are a hypocrite, the Bible says. If you love men alone, you are still a hypocrite. <laughs> Love for God and passionate love for men. You can only make up your mind to be a blessing. Corruption is proof that the love of God is not in the hearts of men. That's right. That's right. This is why the monies that is supposed to be a blessing to everybody can be pocketed by one individual and you don't care. It's not just a demonic issue. It's the absence of love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Not when you pray in tongues. 
not when you walk signs and wonders, when you have love. South Africa, can I be honest with you? We must obtain grace from God to not only love him, but we must restore, not think like him. The love of Jesus. This love factor is a very important one. Because can I tell you this? The reason why many people do not want to be Christians is because there is something about Christians. They watch our lives and they see us pray in tongues, shout in tongues, roll under the anointing, and as soon as we get out from the door, we start slapping one from the door, not outside. When we stab one another with joy. With joy. Oh, I love you. But at the back of it, you are saying, Oh, may you die. May you die. That's right. No. Can you be sincere and genuine that when you say, I love you, you truly mean, I love you. That when you hug one another and say, God bless you, you truly mean it. That when you say, God bless South Africa, you really mean, God bless South Africa. At the end of my life, my greatest joy should not be that I went around the world preaching the gospel, healing the sick, blessing people, influencing a generation. My greatest desire is to be that I love the Lord with all my heart. I loved everyone he sent me to with all my heart and I gave my best to serve his purposes. Are we learning something this morning? Let me wrap up. Can you spare me two minutes? Yes, sir. Now listen, please. Please pay attention. I have taught this and a few of you have heard it in my teachings, but I will wrap up with it. The greatest need of an unbeliever is salvation. Please listen carefully. Anytime you see an unsaved person, the greatest need is not a house to stay. The greatest need is not school fees. The greatest need is not food. The greatest need of an unbeliever is the need to meet Jesus. That means no matter what you do to an unbeliever or for an unbeliever, if Jesus is not part of your gift to him, you really did not help him. That's right. That's right. Please let me repeat this again. Anytime you see an individual who is not saved, your greatest need, in addition to the money, the welfare, in addition to the brotherly kindness, every unbeliever needs Jesus. This is not an evangelist sermon. This is truth. The greatest need of an unbeliever is salvation. Please do not forget this. So every time you see an unbeliever as a matured Christian, if they ask you what is his need, don't look at the obvious. Salvation is the greatest need. The greatest need of a believer who is saved is transformation. Listen to me. If people just get born again and you drop them at the door of the kingdom, that harvest will rot. That's right. Because it takes discipleship to transit them to be transformed so that they can be useful to themselves and to the body. Believers that are not transformed are the ones who cause trouble in churches. If they are not mentored, they are not discipled, the devil will use them. They are one leg in and one leg out. Anytime you see a believer who just got born again, the next part of call is discipleship. A methodical spiritual approach to their growth so that they now become stable through knowledge, stable through training, stable by learning doctrine. Please pay attention. The greatest need of a transformed believer is empowerment. When a believer is now transformed, 
He needs the grace and the power component to now be able to defend and validate the truth you know. Because if you claim knowledge without the grace to validate it, it is false. Again, the greatest need of an unbeliever, help me, salvation. The greatest need of a new believer, transformation. The greatest need of a transformed believer is empowerment. The greatest need of an empowered believer is character and humility. Every time you see an unbeliever in the streets of South Africa, your greatest prayer and need for them is salvation. Every time you see one who claims to be born again and yet has not changed, the greatest need is transformation. When you see one who is zealous and transformed with no results, the greatest need is empowerment. When you see one who is empowered like us who God is helping, your prayer for us now becomes character and humility. Because on the strength of the exploits you are making, pride can get into you and the tendency for all kinds of compromises. I'm teaching you this so you know how to intercede for different levels of people. When you are praying for an unbeliever, don't pray for empowerment. He needs Jesus. When you are praying for a believer, don't pray for anointing. Pray for the discipline to gain knowledge. The ability to endure sound doctrine. When you are now praying for an empowered believer, the ratio of teaching to empowerment is three and a half years to one encounter. So says Jesus. He spent three and a half years mentoring people for one night's encounter. But we have reversed it. Every week is empowerment with little knowledge. So the oil keeps wasting because the vessel is small. It takes a large vessel and oil to equal profit. That's right. If you have the vessel alone with no oil, there is no profit. Mm. If you have oil with a small vessel, there is still no profit. You need a large vessel and oil. That's what equals profit. So if you are to pray for me and pray for your man of God, because by the privilege of God's grace, we've met Jesus. We've been transformed and we are still getting transformed. We've been empowered to a measure by his spirit. Your prayer for us now becomes God keep them. Humility, character. If you are to buy me a book now, you will know what to buy. If you are to pray for me, are you seeing that now? That's right. Pastors, break your congregation into four. There are those who always come who are not in the kingdom. You must, there must be a menu to serve those people. The menu is Jesus. No matter what you teach, remember. There are those who come to church who are yet to figure out their way through life. They have accepted Jesus. The menu for them is the, God's, the truths of the kingdom, the mysteries of the kingdom. You are equipping them with the weapons of victory that help them to be sound. Then, for those who have advanced, maybe some of your leaders that God has helped, you must create a platform to empower them so that they are not frustrated. It is frustrating to know so much and have so little results. You need the empowerment of the spirit. And then for those who are empowered and are doing so much, you need to have a platform to call them and re-emphasize character. And can I tell you this? When you get to the end of that circle, you go back again. You start again with Jesus, transformation, empowerment, character. Go back again. Jesus. You have to learn this before we pray. Wow. Wow. Learn this. Next time you see an unsaved person, you know what he needs. Can you buy me ice cream? Yes. But more than the ice cream, you need Jesus. When you see someone who is transformed and says, look, I want to start ministry, you tell him, please settle down. You will do ministry, but for now, there is bankruptcy of knowledge. Going to do ministry will destroy you and everybody who sincerely follows you because what you need now is not ordination. What you need is transformation. 
When you learn this, we are not just going to arbitrarily ordain people and keep producing children who keep destroying people. Transformation. This is the discipleship manual of the kingdom. From Jesus, it is transformation. From transformation, it is empowerment. From empowerment, and when you get there, there is no arrival. You still meet Jesus there again. Another dimension of Jesus. Then another dimension of transformation. Then another dimension of empowerment. Then exploits. And while you are around the world and people are calling you Apostle Joshua Selman, one night you will say, let's go for a retreat again. Come on now. Pride is already growing. Lust is already growing. You are a man of God and everybody call you king of kings, but let's go back to the drawing room. Come on, and you come, come back again come to on. Jesus. And from Jesus, he tells you something again, transformation. Then he gives you another level of the anointing. Then another level of exploits. And then he comes to check again and says, now you are already talking with kings. Nations are calling you. But there is something you need to learn. The fathers of faith, when they got here, they could not cross the line. So they missed it. There's something I must teach you. Let's go back to the drawing room. Rise up on your feet. We have to end. Hmm. Please, if you forget anything that I've taught you, do not forget this. Give every man of God you love and you know these teachings to listen to. And tell them, I have a gift for you. I hope I'm not rude doing this, but I think this will bless you. Imagine what every Sunday and every weekday looks like in South Africa. That at the end of that service, those who need Jesus find Jesus. Those who need the principles of the kingdom, which is also Jesus the way, find Jesus. Those who need spiritual empowerment because they are frustrated at various levels of their lives, they come and they find an oasis of power. And those who are in exploits right now and the devil is destroying them and they are plunging down. They mismanage the anointings that God gave them and it looks like ministry is about to end. When they come, you still have what to tell them. You don't discuss power. You tell them, go for a retreat. There is a need. Do you know, the higher you rise in this kingdom, the stricter God is with you. That's true. That's true. There are things that God will permit in others. But because of the delicate nature of where you are standing and the souls that are tied to you, you will see God pruning you as if you are as if you are a backslider. He is doing it because he knows your destruction is equal to the fall of millions. And God will say, no, no, no. I have to guard you. So the moment you see God protecting you, how do you do with VIPs in South Africa? The, more, the higher they are, the more you protect them. Right. Because the destruction of that one person, the devil will rather attack one solid man of God than to attack two million South Africans who would rather attack one solid man of God than to attack two million South Africans. So the higher you rise, God can now be giving you strict rules. Rules that sometimes may not make sense until you get to that level. There is no point teaching people lower than you. You will destroy them. It is a dealing made for your realm. God can tell you, if you want me to continue with you from this level, you must enter a covenant with me that every week you must set one day for me. And you say, Lord, but for the past 20 years, it's not been like that. He said, because you have not gotten to this realm. The kind of anointing I'm giving you, if you are angry and you speak with it, you can kill a human being. Right. I have to supervise you. I can't just give you that anointing without working on your heart. This is why we must be careful with random impartations. You transfer graces to immature people. They use that grace and the grace will first destroy them because they do not know how to handle it. It's like giving a learner a truck, a giant truck. Can I tell you, all it takes to preach in is not this mic. There is a skill to standing here.
We have to pray. Tonight, we're going to trust God for an open heavens in this place. Amen. And Apostle Felix has graciously allowed that we bring in our prayer requests. Please, even for those who are not able to come here, submit your prayer requests. Those online, I'm sure there should be a way of communicating your prayer requests. Tonight, the Lord is going to be stepping in as a mighty, mighty God. Hear me. There are some of you who are going to be bringing people who need Jesus. Tonight, they will find him. There are some of you who have been attending this conference. Most of us, all of us in fact. And God has been equipping us with strategic knowledge and challenging us. It's called transformation. But there are many of you who sincerely without pride, you have worked with God. You have been diligent to listen. You have learned. But this lack of results, we must end it now. Amen. You need empowerment. You need empowerment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listen. You see, the thing about the anointing is that if it is not there, it's not there. That's right. You can't fake it, hope it, wish it if it is not there. It's as simple as that. There are many men of God who are people of character and love Jesus. But the, the limitation to their next level, they can't do much for the kingdom. I want you to come this night with your heart open. There are business people who they have vowed to God and say, Lord, as you bless me, your house, I've, I've already covenanted with you right. that your house will not suffer. But the empowerment to shift them to that realm. Come tonight with your heart opened. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You have shown us your mercy. You have shown us your grace. They may never understand why we lift our hands and worship you. They may never understand why we say thank you and we roll from left to right. But we are a people who are grateful. Thank you, O oh God, for Apostle Felix. Thank you for this conference. Only God can tell how many people are being transformed right now by the power of this conference. Many of you, all the pockets of impartations that have happened and are happening to you, in one moment, God is changing your life. Please hear me. Believe me when I tell you this truth you have heard will move by the angel of his presence across the length and the breadth of South Africa. Amen. I am telling you this not, not, not for pride. Yes. There are many ministers who will take this message and go for a retreat. And by the time they come out, the version of them you used to know, full of flesh, childishness, God will wash them with the word and they will come out, be prepared to see brand new vessels. Come on. Yes, sir. Hear me. South Africa, let me prophesy to you before we round up. You are already in a season where God has been doing a lot of prunings and purgings in the house of the Lord. I'm speaking by the Spirit. There has been a lot of prunings. And he's not done yet. But as this season has come before you, the next season that is opening up, listen to me, is a season of personalized dealings. And it's going to start with men of God. You will see many people shut down for weeks because they are tired of pretending, tired of faking it. You write this thing and you'll see. I'm saying it as a prophecy over the church in South Africa. Many people will increasingly become dissatisfied and say, I can't do ministry this way. My conscience keeps telling me there's something I'm doing that is wrong. I can't manipulate and go to hell. And you will see people, be careful, don't conclude on people. Because while you are talking about Jesus who has died, he may have come back to life and you do not know. Do not conclude on people. You will see people who were once with all kinds of character defaults. 
all kinds of destructive habits, ill-mentored, but they will go and cry before the Lord with all their hearts and the God of heaven who is ever merciful will come to them and say, because you are broken, I will help you. Let's start again. I'm saying this as a prophetic word. You will see business people who have gone down, who have become instruments of shame, go back to God and meet men of God in genuine repentance. Hear me. Now is not the season to write off people and point fingers. You may point an accusing finger that you will spend the rest of your life in shame when you see God elevating the supposed nobodies. Anything you do not understand about the move of God in South Africa, here is my counsel. Just pray. Pray and leave it there. Don't go around making assumptions. You will make mistakes that you may pay the price for. But can I tell you, in those moments of prunings, preserve this prophetic word. In those moments of prunings, many will find Jesus. In those process of prunings, many people will not only find Jesus, they will enter a renewed covenant. Covenant of holiness, covenants of sincerity. And can I tell you this, South Africa, from the ashes of what you now see, there is a new church that is rising. Glory. Glory to Jesus. Yes. I thought I would give this prophecy at our last session, but I just sense it in my spirit. There are men of God who will be used in this nation. They are not yet in ministry. They are still in the cave of Adulam going through the trainings. They are not on TV. They don't even know how far God will use them in fastings, in praying. Some of them would have been released years before to their destruction, but God kept them. Some of them thought they were, it was delay. That delay was not demonic. God was preserving you so that after the purging, you will be part of the purified bride that will now arise. I'm saying this by the Spirit. Hear me, South Africa. From the north to the south, the east and the west of your region, suddenly, a season will come when a spiritual shofar will sound over this city and you will see men and women of God, a balance of character, a balance of doctrine, a balance of anointing, a balance of honor to authority, a balance of submission to Jesus. This is the breed that God is raising. That once again, our pulpits will become a place of genuine fire. Come on. Come on. Genuine grace. Yes, sir. Genuine impact. Yes, sir. Genuine salvation. Yes, sir. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I believe that this conference is a trigger to the gun. Amen. Jesus. Hear what I'm telling you. Hear what I'm telling you. I'm speaking by the Spirit of God. Help them. We're wrapping up. I apologize. But I want you, that's why I said, get this teaching to any man of God. The last thing I would tell you, South Africa, you will never win when you fight yourself. You will only win in love. Men of God, I know that there are people who have fallen. I know that there are people who have been wounded. Let us show the world what it means to be in the kingdom. Do not rejoice over the destruction of anyone called of God. If you do not understand the dealings of the spirit, pray. Because, help that man. For many of you, you have already made mistakes. Rejoicing over the pain of others. Not knowing that the refiner's fire is also coming to you. That's it. Can I tell you this? In this refining, no one will be spared. No one. He does not refine you because you are corrupted. He refines you because he wants you to do more. Amen. 
He that has an ear, hear what the Spirit said to the churches. Practice love. Write a list of the names of the men of God in your nation and your region. Intercede for them. Pray for them. They may not know you. They may not be your men of God. Just pray for them. Lord, I don't know what you are doing in the body, but continue, do not stop. But pray for them. And then, let me speak finally to the younger ministers. Don't laugh at the fathers. That's right. You may not know what it takes to carry this mantle. Yes, sir. Can I yes, tell sir. you the truth? On easy lies the head that wears the crown. That's right. you, if you are Elijah, Jezebel will come after you. If you are Samson, Delilah will come after you. There are attacks that don't follow men. They follow mantles. So before you covet mantles, make sure you have the stamina. Ooh. We'll leave the rest for tonight. Please lift your hands. We have to wrap up. Lord, we thank you for this conference. We mean business with you. This is South Africa. This is Africa. Even so, come Yeshua, come. Even so, come and take your bride away. Yes, Lord. How my soul longs to see your face. My king, even so, even so, come Yeshua, come. South Africa is praying. Even so, come Yeshua, come. The spirit of revival. Even so, come and take your bride away. How my soul longs to see your face, my Lord. Even so, even so, come Yeshua, come. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. Salaska de Bashkana Kata Branda Katekatos Kate Branda Katapa Kotos Koto Brekateka Nekata The face of development Lord grant me the discipline